So we're going to look at The Road by Nancy Fotheringham Cato. The first thing I want you to do with this poem is just read it aloud to yourself. Um, so I can't have it here just because of copyright. Um, but you're going to read the whole poem aloud to yourself and just underline any imagery or anything that seems kind of striking or important to you in terms of the story of the poem. There's a little bit of vocab here as well that you can look at if you need some help with the vocab. Yeah, so we'll jump into the story. So you can see that she is talking about a kind of landscape at night time and she sees the moon rising but stops it and makes it go back a hill. She's driving on the road leading east the stars that are moving in a crowd, but she's driving so fast that it felt like the sun could come back up again. The night is like a long black carpet unrolling under the wheels of the car, covering the landscape that she crosses and everything in front is bright. The fence posts move so fast along the wires, they look like the days that go by too fast. The telephone posts look like they mark the years, but they slip away into the past. So you can see the themes of journeys and passage of time arising here. And also the fact that she's kind of a lone traveler moving through this kind of symbolic landscape that represents her life to her as she goes through it. The ending of the poem is saying that there's no way to tell the sky and the road apart by the time she's going so fast that everything combines into one image. She keeps rushing towards the sun through the night, which might be a reference to the idea that there's this kind of light at the end of the tunnel when you die that you kind of hurtle towards, supposedly. So it's this idea of um, the passage of time in a quite abstract sense, the way that time moves around us, the way that days and years sort of slip by and it feels like we're kind of rushing through our lives towards the end. So there's a sense that she's trying to escape darkness and move towards the sun. And it seems that she's in control of this. She's pushing the moon back and she's trying to catch up with the day. You can actually do this if you fly. I don't know if you've ever been on a long flight, but you can kind of catch up with the day if you fly fast enough. So it's, it's quite a surreal type of feeling if you're flying kind of towards the sun. And you go through different time zones and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, there's a sense of melancholy, there's a sense of sadness, but also determination and this um, sort of this order versus chaos theme going through the poem. There's no concrete details about the speaker or really the world that she's in. So the poem's a very abstract representation of time, life, death, the universe, those types of big ideas. They're symbolically represented by a landscape, but the landscape is quite nondescript and not um, described in a lot of detail so that we can see it's kind of a metaphor uh, for life and time. So there's quite a lot of language features here. I'm going to whiz through some of them, but feel free to pause and look through in more detail. You can also go to the Scribbly page to download this document as well. The night is like a long black carpet. There's this really nice poem called The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes that um, if you have time, I recommend reading it because it's just it's a really cool poem. My gran used to read it to me when I was a kid. And um, it has this repeated line in it about the road being a ribbon of moonlight. So I don't know if she's drawing on that old poem. But yeah, you've got this idea that there's a carpet stretched out or a ribbon. There's something kind of like a strip of fabric across the land. So the blackness represents darkness, but it also symbolically represents kind of the unknown. So there's a sense that she's kind of going out of an unknown dark landscape that's potentially dangerous or threatening towards light, which usually symbolically represents 
spiritual wholeness or kind of enlightenment, purity. So there's a sense that you're kind of leaving darkness behind and moving towards light. So it's not a necessarily negative take on death. It's more of a kind of, um, yeah, positive and call at the end of the life in this poem. It's kind of like she's motivated to speed up as she goes through life. You can see these kinds of continuous verbs being used here. So rising moon, shouldering hill. Um, there's a sense of movement in a continuous verb that means the action is happening constantly. So um, it creates a sense of constant motion around uh, what's happening to her. Like we're saying, sun, bright, eastern. These are kind of central motifs that show light that she's headed towards. And they're juxtaposed with more nocturnal elements like black or moon or still. You might notice that she uses this word and at the beginning of several sentences or several uh, lines. We call that anaphora. So anaphora is when you repeat the beginning of uh, a phrase multiple times over. So in this case, it conveys the sort of rapidity, but also um, the repetition of these things that she's seeing and experiencing around her. Um, but I, I feel like it might also be biblical because if you read passages from the Bible, they do often say, and this, and then they tell part of the story and then they start again and say, and that. So there's a kind of hidden, almost biblical illusion there, I think, through this use of anaphora. I think my favorite image in the poem is this zoomorphism, the stars swarmed behind the trees. You've got the sense of like swarming stars being like insects. And uh, they kind of represent, I think, chaos, like the abstract chaos of the universe itself. Um, and even though it's stars in the sky, you could kind of imagine that as the, you know, the behavior of atoms or particles or that kind of thing as well. It feels quite like a scientific um, biological type of image. So it's a ballad form, um, which means it's quite easy to remember and it feels a little bit like a song. It uses a very clear rhyming structure that feels quite stable and um, predictable in a way. So against the chaos, there's this sort of stability that's uh, placed against it. So the iambic tetrameter and trimeter kind of create this lilting rhythm to the poem that propels it forwards. This is often a meter that's also used in hymns, for example. So it, again, it kind of has that like religious undertone to it without being an overtly religious poem. And the title, I think, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about this title and then other poems that come to mind. I did mention The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes, um, but two that are really very close, I think, in meaning to this poem. And I'm sure um, Cato is influenced by these two here. So The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost and Because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson. Um, so I really recommend this task if you've got time just pause the video now and read those two poems and think about the way that the roads work in those poems and try and do comparisons and contrasts with the poem here. Especially in terms of the meaning of the poem, I think it's so close to Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death, it must almost be directly influenced by it because um, it has this kind of transcendentalist feeling where it's uh, kind of, you know, all of the world is symbolic and it's not like, it's almost like not a real landscape. It's just a symbolic landscape for the way that the universe works and these kind of abstract notions of, of life work. So yeah, because I could not stop for death, it's a really, uh, really nice little poem. Um, I analyze it as well on, on Scribbly. So if you uh, have a subscription to Scribbly, you can just have a look at that poem and my analysis of it and, the Dickinson collection. Um, it might be on YouTube too, so you might find it there. 
yeah, it's a really, really cool poem and it's, it's very similar. Um, and I think understanding that poem also will help you reflect on this poem here. So there's a few more structure and form features here that you can kind of look through in your own time if you need. So a little bit of context about her. She's an Australian poet, a modernist poet. And the kind of um, dark wildness and potentially, you know, dangerousness, potential danger of the landscape is very much like uh, how it feels to be in an Australian landscape at night. Um, so I, I lived in Australia for three months and uh, I lived in this place called the bush, which is like the, the kind of wild edge of civilization. And the way that she describes the landscape here um, is the tone of it and the atmosphere of it is very comparable to what I experienced living in Perth. So, um, yeah, you've got this sense that, you know, not every landscape at night would necessarily be dangerous to you, but definitely in Australia, it's such a wild place and it's so difficult to exist out there. And there's a lot of creatures that are potentially dangerous to you. So you can kind of see how her Australian background is informing her interpretation of um, the danger of that landscape. It's also a post-war poem. So it's a time when Australia is recovering from World War II. Um, it came close to being invaded. They had a lot of Australian soldiers sent um, to help the war effort. You can read about Anzac if you're interested in that as well. And you can kind of see this sort of desolation and kind of emptiness filtering into um, the poem. She was an activist and she was particularly interested in landscape preservation. So her poetry um, is very much kind of tied to the landscape and the nature of Australia, but it's also responding to the sort of social climate of the time. So these points from context, if you put them in an essay, they'll really help you kind of open up your analysis of the poem and go a bit deeper into it. So we've got some attitudes here as well, some key ideas. There's a sense of hope maybe that that light represents. It could represent death and kind of, um, you know, your matter being returned to the earth in this kind of uh, abstract sense of like, you know, peace that comes with death. But it could also represent um, the idea of hope that she's kind of moving towards something better, less dark, less um, intimidating, less confusing. And that might be a commentary on... Um, the social climate as well, that they're, they're sort of clawing their way out of uh, the depression after the, the war. So yeah, the sense that there's, you know, time gets, seems to get faster as you age. That's a genuine phenomenon that I've heard a lot of people talk about. And I think it's just because, you know, if you're 10 years old, a year is like a 10th of your life. But if you're, um, I don't know, 50 years old, a year is like a 50th of your life. So time doesn't seem as long, <laughs> if that makes sense. I'm not really good at explaining it. But there is a feeling like every, every year that you live goes a little bit faster. So it might be just trying to capture that experience of aging and um, the, the strange relationship that humans have with their perception of time. So there's a sense that we should live life to the full and we should be in control of the journey or the trajectory of our lives as well. This road is a very symbolic or metaphorical road. It's not a, a physical road. So the best way to analyze this poem is just always try and figure out what does the road mean and what do you think it represents? And there are multiple things it could refer to as well. So be aware of those multiple interpretations when you're analyzing. Um, so yeah, possibly it's a sense, uh, you know, an anti-death poem that you, you kind of want to consciously direct your life and be in control of its trajectory rather than just passively, you know, fading away into darkness. Um, so Dylan Thomas has this poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And uh, that's more about the dying of the light. So it's more about like resisting <laughs> your, your life kind of going out. But it's a similar kind of idea that there's sort of somebody's kind of 
core willpower is needed to put them on the right path in life and then kind of stick to that path and like the the car and the driver of the car who's the speaker has this kind of intention and purpose behind the motion that they're they're creating and they're trying to um you know get out of darkness into the light so they've got this kind of core intention behind the actions that they perform in the poem so yeah hyper abstract poem has some themes you can have a look at and some exercises you can try so the only thing you'd really maybe struggle with with this poem is just the abstractness of all the possible things it could mean in the way that it's not meant to be taken literally so it's a hyper symbolic hyper figurative poem um, so yeah try the exercises if you're struggling with it a little bit they'll help you kind of understand the more abstract ideas and try making little mind maps on how the poem relates to all of these themes as well because that will help you too and when you're ready you can try some essay questions um so yeah thank you very much for listening if you need any more resources you can go to scribbly.com and um yeah hopefully i'll see you guys soon with a future poem bye for now